I once asked the Hall of Fame goaltender Ken Dryden, when was the golden age of hockey? His answer, whatever you were watching when you were 12 years old. Well, when I was 12, Team Canada and the Soviet Union met for an eight-game summit series that was, and as far as I'm concerned, still is, the most important hockey series ever played. It all happened 50 years ago this month. One of Team Canada's goalies was Ken Dryden. He chronicles the events of a half century ago in the series, what I remember, what it felt like, and what it feels like now. And Ken Dryden joins us now here in the studio. So great to have you back here again. Thanks, Steve. Glad when, to be here. When this, and we are, we are sitting here on September 28th, 50 years to the day of Game 8. We'll get back to that in a little bit. But when they announced that this was all going to happen, were you anxious to be chosen for this team? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I had just, I had finished my first full year with the Canadians. Um, and... And, and I, had done, I had done well in the first couple of years. And, um, um, and this, was, this was big. I mean, th this, this was going to be the biggest series that anybody had ever seen. And, and big because um, if you were a, a kid growing up around that time, and I was born in 1947, um, is that by the time I started to follow hockey, I was becoming aware of international hockey, and and uh, and and particularly, it started in the mid 1950s, when in 1954, the Russians won the World Hockey Championship, and that was stunning, because you know the Soviet Union had only started hockey eight years earlier in 1946, they they won, and when 1955 came around that was a big deal because now we had to win it back. And it was the Penticton V's that represented Canada and, and Foster Hewitt flew to Europe to do the games. And Foster Hewitt didn't do that. I mean, that he was the voice of the Toronto Maple Leafs mm -hmm. and of, 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 of hockey in English Canada. But there he was on the radio and I'm seven years old and I'm in the playground at Humber Valley School and I'm and I'm listening to the final game, and 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 Penticton won five nothing, and that was big, and and then we lost the next year in the Olympics in in '56 in Cortina, but then we started to win, and 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 Whitby Dunlops in '57, Belleville McFarlands Trail Smoke Eaters, <laughs> but then we started to lose. And, and we weren't going to win again. I mean, that, that the Europeans were becoming too good. Uh, the Soviets were becoming the best of the Europeans. And in the 80s, the national team was created by Father Bauer uh, to attract a lot of the better juniors, but that proved not to be enough either. So when 1972 came around, this was the moment where for all of those years, when we knew we were the best in the world and everybody knew that, but they were called the world champions. We finally had a chance and, and so it was big. Best on best, finally. 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 Well, it was going to be an eight game series, four here, four over there, and you get to start game one in Montreal mm -hmm. and everybody assumes that it's going to be a cakewalk. And here's how you remember it. As described in your book, at some point, probably the day before the first game, Team Canada coach Harry Sinden told me I would play but I don't remember. I don't remember flying to Montreal. I don't remember the day of the game. I don't remember the dressing room. All I remember is a feeling that kept building and building, growing and growing. Okay, what was different? It was just, um, it was an excitement. I mean, and, and Montreal is an exciting place. Montreal is, and, and was at that time, is now the, the most exciting hockey place in the world. Um, I had played in, in the Forum. I had played in the Stanley Cup Finals in the Forum. So you should have been calm. I, well, I don't know whether I should have been calm, <laughs> but I should have been <laughs> used to the atmosphere. Right. And, 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 and the noise of it all. And, and, but this kept, as I said, you know, growing and building. And, and, uh, and, and in, into unfamiliar territory. And of where... You, you don't know what it's building to. You don't know what that means to you, how you're going to react 
to all of that because that I hadn't been a part of and as none of us had been. And, uh, um, and, and, and when you know, the, the opening ceremonies took place and, and, and Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau uh, dropped the puck, I mean, one of the, one of the classic little moments that demonstrated the feeling of it is that this was a ceremonial face-off. And whoever the Soviet player was, I have no idea, but it was Phil Esposito for us. And, you know, ceremonial face-offs, drop the puck, the, the home team captain just kind of gathers the puck up, picks it up, hands it to the honoree, and that's the end of it. You watch Phil Esposito, <laughs> he, he whips it back. And later he says, I had to win that draw. You know, well, that's not how it happens you know, before, but that's what it felt like. It shows you it was going to be a different kind of series. Absolutely. Well, it was a different kind of first game, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Soviet 7, Canada 3, you were in goal, and here's what you wrote. In the dressing room after the game, I must have said something to reporters. I don't know what I said. I didn't want to look in any direction. I didn't want anyone to look at me. I don't remember feeling I had let everyone down, my teammates, my country. I was just embarrassed. I didn't want to hide. I wanted the world to go away. What was the kind of consensus in the dressing room after you realized, after game one, this is not going to be the eight game sweep we were told yeah. it was going to be? I, I, think, I think that feeling started earlier than the end of the first game. Um, I think it started probably um, by the middle of the first period. Um, but, but again, you're so absorbed in playing that you, you, you're, not, you're not entirely conscious of it, but that kind of recognition is starting to creep in that, that even, you know, we, we scored in the first minute um, but then before we scored in, in, the, in the sixth minute, uh, which would seem to be incredibly decisive, I mean, two goals in the first you know, six minutes, um, but, but between those two goals even, that, that play was back and forth. It was pretty even. Um, they looked like they belonged. And, and then after we scored the second goal, then at some point they made it two to one, and before the end of the period it was two two. And I can remember coming back and, and make reference to it into the dressing room, and Harry Sinden, our, our coach, you know, says, "Well, you didn't think it was going to be easy, did you?" And of course we did. You did, yes. And and but at that moment, I think it, there was a recognition that this was going to be tough. Paul Henderson was in this studio nine years ago. We talked about you. Sheldon, if you would, let's roll that clip. I never felt so sorry for a Ken Dryden in my life. Every time he thought they were going to shoot it, they passed it. When he thought they were going to pass it, they shot it. And uh, major, major league wake-up call. Sound familiar? Yeah, it, uh, that's, that's what happened. I mean, in, in, in a lot of ways, that is what it was. Did you have to figure out how to completely play your game differently, given that the opponent was playing a brand of hockey you were not accustomed yeah. to. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, when you're a goalie, you're a responder. You're not an initiator. So you 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 respond to what's in front of you, what's coming at you. If if what's coming at you is different, you have to have a different response. And so. You know that that in in you know, in the NHL, certainly by the '60s, even the late '50s, and 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 into the '70s, it was a power game. It was you know the big shooters, the the uh, the the you know the curved blades, Bobby Hull, Frank Mahovlich, 100 miles an hour, just blasting the puck from the wings, and so the puck would be moved forward. It would be moved to the to the wing uh, for the big shot. I mean, goalies, we wore a lot better equipment than had been in the past, but it still wasn't great. And it wasn't that big. And so there was an awful lot of net that, that was open, no matter what position we were in. And, and here's a puck coming at you 100 miles an hour. You don't have much time to move very far. And so the only way you could really counteract that is to move out in what's called cutting the angle. And, and so the, all of that's great for an NHL game. Here you had the Soviets coming down, and instead of making the big shot, they'd look to pass it laterally. You pass it laterally, 
I'm out to cut the angle on one. This other shooter has got a whole open net. And, and all that you can see is, you know, all you can do is you sort of throw yourself back, throw it an arm, throw it a leg and hope. And, and I was doing far too much of that. I mean, of, mm. of just, you know, pr protecting the net with a single arm or a single leg. I had to find a way of fighting all of my instincts and training to move myself back into the net so I could adapt to the passing. You figured it out. Well, it, it was painful, and I mean, <laughs> it, it, it was. Well, okay, so game one doesn't go too well. Game two was in Toronto, and your teammate with the Montreal Canadiens, Pete Mahovlich, scores still, for my money, the best shorthanded goal I've ever seen in my life, and I want to see it again. So, <laughs> go. Then, Estacada cleared out. It's a race down with Peter Mahovlich going in on goal. Right in! I don't know what was more fun, watching that just now or watching you react yeah. to that just now. You still well, get a kick out of well, that. It, yeah, and, 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 and just knowing Pete. And, and as, I, I, as I've said to Pete, uh, that, that when Tony Esposito and I weren't playing in, in the games, we, would, we, would bat, we, we didn't sit on the bench as the backup. We sat in the crowd. Right. So I was in the crowd for that game. And, I, and, and Peter, of course, has been milking his goal forever. And, and I'm saying, Pete, you know, I have no visual memory of your goal whatsoever. <laughs> the only thing I do have a memory of is that I, I have a memory of my own voice. And, my, and, and my, my own voice is, ooh, oh, ah. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense because there's three parts of that yeah, goal. Yeah, yeah. And, and it was that. And, and like in, in, in the book, there's a picture of Peter scoring that goal. And the caption is, Ooh, oh, ah. <laughs> well, unfortunately for you guys, you blow a lead in Winnipeg and have to settle for a tie, and then you lose in Vancouver and get booed off the ice. Yikes. And Phil Esposito gives this legendary Gettysburg address after the game in an interview with Johnny Esau. And again, I want to see some of that too. Sheldon, <laughs> if you would. Every one of us guys, 35 guys that came out and played for Team Canada, we did it because we love our country and not for any other reason, no other reason. They can throw the money uh, for the pension fund out the window, they can throw anything they want out the window. We came because we love Canada. And even though we play in the United States and we earn money in the United States, Canada is still our home and that's the only reason we come. And I don't think it's fair that we should be booed. That speech, we are told, had a massive impact on the Canadian people who watched it after the game was over. Yeah. What about on you? No, because I mean, we never saw it. You know, we're, we're, in the, we're in the dressing room after the game. And, and we're not, you know, there are no TVs in the dressing room and we're not exactly in a mood to be watching our teammates being interviewed. And I'm not even sure that any of us knew about it for weeks later, if not months later. Hmm. But I think that, you know, that the point is correct. I think it had a real impact on the Canadian public because I, th and, and I mean, it, it really is a, a classic, it, and it is like a speech rather than an answer. And, 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 and here you have this moment where we, you know, we're not only booed off the ice, we're booed on the ice. Mm. And, 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 and fans are just really angry with us. I mean, again, this, this is supposed to be our moment, you know, that of, of, of showing the world what we are. And now we're behind two games to one with one game tied. Now we're heading to Moscow. Big where ice. It gets, really gets tough, yep. and 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 here are the, the these NHL players who, with the World Hockey Association now, are you know, competing for us. Big contracts, agents carrying attaché cases. You know, these are guys that clearly don't care. That you know, they they don't care. Look at look at you know the look at them out on the ice. They don't care, and look at us. We care as fans. We care desperately as, as fans. And then Esposito, you see that face on that screen, sweat pouring down his face, the look in his eyes. You know he cares. The tone in his voice, yeah. he cares. Yeah. And, and, and the fans I'm sure at, at home, it's like, huh, right. Yes, you know, and, and I think really from that moment on, it, I mean, the series started as us and us, us and the fans. It became a kind of us and them, 
by Vancouver, and I think it was an us and us afterwards. The thing, the one game in this series I really understood the least was game five, which you guys were all set to win. Yeah. And then somehow the Soviets are like bang, 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 and they win, and you guys go off the ice, 3,000 fans from Canada are cheering you now mm -hmm. as you go off the ice. And from what I've heard from other players, you go in the dressing room after the game and you feel, okay, we know we can beat these yeah. guys now. Yeah. I don't get that. You just lost yeah. again. Yeah. And, and you it, lost in a bad way again. Yeah. Where did that confidence come from? Yeah, I think, I think, I mean, it was, it was the first, even, even in, in, in Toronto, we played well. I think in Moscow, that first game, we found our game. And I think that was the feeling in it. Yeah, we blew it and we shouldn't have blown it. And now we're even further up against it, three games to one, you know, that we're down. Mm -hmm. But we were good that night. And, 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 and I think that the ways in which we weren't good were fixable. And, and, and whereas before, things, there were enough things that were going wrong that you weren't entirely sure that they could be fixed in time. Now we knew that they could be, and now it was a matter of, of doing it. But the, I mean, you know, I don't know if you want to, I mean, the, the Canadian fans, and we may get into this later, mm -hmm. you know, but, but the Canadian fans were amazing. I mean, they really were. I mean, it, and, and all you need to do again is just try to imagine, this is 1972. You know, Canadians aren't traveling to Europe a heck of a lot in 1972, and they certainly aren't traveling behind the Iron Curtain or to Moscow. And here are 3,000 Canadians descending on Moscow. And these are not bucket list Canadians with, their, with the, the means to go out and just decide that they want certain experiences and go to certain places and they can you know, fund their way to get there and then they check it off and it's, and it's gone except as a story to tell their friends. These were people who were pretty ordinary Canadians who were there from a lot of different places that weren't called Toronto or Montreal, mm -hmm. but a lot of small places across the country, and who just felt they needed to be there. And whether it had to do with hockey or with Canada or with chances are with both, there was some mix of the two that, that, that got inside them and that they decided they needed to be there. And, and, and 3,000 Canadians you know, made 10, more noise uh, than ten thousand Soviets. I was going to say, yeah, you know, that's exactly what they did, and and the and the classic was that they they came up with this chant, <laughs> and and that was amazing. Did you know what it was when you first? It was da da Canada yeah. net net Soviet. Yeah. Did you know yeah. what it was when you first heard? Yeah, it? I did. did. Well, I, I had played with the national team, and I had played, right. and, and and so I knew you know, a few Russian words, and I and I certainly knew da da Canada and yet yet Soviet. But again, whoever came up with it, and it would have been spontaneous, and it would have been kind of dumb stuff with ten guys in a bar, and then they start it, you know, during the games, and then the other three thousand people pick it up, and that's pretty nice to hear. Game six is perhaps best known for Bobby Clark's slash on the ankle of Valerie Harlamov, their best player, or certainly one of their best players, rendering him ineffective for the rest of the series. And you write in your book, this wasn't war, it wasn't life and death, but what if it feels like life and death? What would I have done? I'd like to think I know, I don't know. Have you ever talked to Bobby about that moment? Never no, have, I never eh? have. I mean, I... I, I, I I never even knew it happened for, I'm sure, a couple of weeks, if not a few months. You were after ten feet away from it when it happened. I don't think so. No. I don't know, but but well, but again, like, and, and you you preface your question by saying Game Six was best, you know, known for. I'm not sure it was. I mean, I think in retrospect it was. Yeah. Not at the but, time. But not at the time. No, it was I a, mean, a win for you guys well, at the time. Well, yes, Big one. but it but it's also, I mean that that. One, I, I'm not sure how many people actually saw it at the moment so that, so that it would become a big moment to them at that time. I mean, we're down three games to one and one game tied at that moment. And, and our focus is absolutely elsewhere. I mean, in terms of trying to win this game or otherwise the series is over. And, and, uh, and, 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 and the thing of it is, and, and this, is, this is hard to 
convey um, is that is that is that players get injured all the time, and that and, and that's not talking about how this happened. But players are on the ice, and then they're not on the ice, and 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 you as an opponent may not even notice that they're not on the ice. You as 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 the team of the injured player, you have to adapt. That's what you do all the time as 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 players. But don't you infer, adapt. Don't infer from my question that uh, that I don't know at the same time that the Soviets were dirty as hell no, and spearing no. and kicking and yeah, no, no. and I've heard the stories about Gary Bergman being yeah. cut and his skate filled with blood afterwards. Yeah. But what I inferred from your quote was, were you in the same set yeah. of circumstances? Yeah. You're not sure you I wouldn't have done the same I thing. I, I'm not like. You know, the, the, I mean, the, the the example that I think all of us use, which you know is, is and it's a it's a terrific reference point, is it is has to do with going to war. I mean, you think of World War One, you think of World War Two, that that a week before you're in the trenches or on the front lines, you're in an office somewhere, you're on a farm somewhere, you just cannot conceive that you have a weapon in your hand and somebody is coming towards you and you are firing at that person. You cannot imagine that. You've never done that before in your life. It's just not you. And then those things happen. I don't think any of us really know what, you know, what we are capable of depending on what the circumstances present themselves as and how we react to those circumstances. So yeah, I'd like to think that I have a line and that I don't go over that line and things like that. But I suspect that you and anybody else, you know, we at, at moments that line is is in, in in danger. I mean, that suddenly you get to that line and you don't know whether you go over it or not. And I think that's mostly what happened. Mm. Team Canada wins Game Six. Paul Henderson scores the winning goal. Team Canada wins Game Seven. Paul Henderson scores the winning goal. Mm -hmm. Game Eight. You're the starting goalie. You're down 5-3 after two periods. Mm -hmm. Put us in the dressing room. Did you guys really think you could come back? Yeah, I mean, like, I, I think you, well, first of all, you don't think. You know, you, you, you know your situation. I mean, it's 5-3. Seven games and two periods have been played. There are tw there's one period left, 20 minutes. That's it. There isn't a ninth game. There isn't an overtime, there isn't a shootout. There are 20 minutes to go. That's it. This is not a moment to think. This is not, um, and, 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 and you, it, it, it is a time to know. And the knowing is easy because the circumstances that you're presented with are easy. You know, there's no point in feeling sorry for yourself, you know, worrying about what you didn't do before or the rest of it. It's 20 minutes and now it's time to do. It's not to think, to worry, to anything else. You just do, and and it's always a, a who knows, you know, uh, with it. And and all that you do know is that you just do, and you do it for those twenty minutes, and you see what happens. You see what's going to happen. I will never get tired of looking at this. Go. Thirty-four seconds to play. Here's a shot. Anderson made a wild stab toward Bell. Here's another. The first question I need to ask you is, what were you doing in that <laughs> scrum? Goalies don't normally go 200 feet to celebrate with their teammates. What were you doing down there? Yeah, you know, you do, you don't think. <laughs> <laughs> Had you ever done that before? I don't think so. I don't I mean, think so I, either. No, I, I, uh, no I'm, I'm sure I haven't. And uh, I mean, <laughs> again, you know, that, that, that you know, you, they're, uh, all I can remember is either Henderson's arms going up or the red light going on or something. And then, and then literally, I guess the same almost with the Pete story. I don't have any visual memory. I've got an, an audio memory. And the memory is I'm around center ice. And goalie skates, especially at that time, they were big, clunky things. And so 
I'm skating up the ice, which in, at my speed, which I think is really fast, but isn't. <laughs> and all I can hear is clomp, clomp, clomp. And that's what I hear. I mean, that's my memory of it. I hear this clomp, clomp, clomp of my skates. And I can hear my own whooping uh, in my ears. And then finding myself in that scrum there at the end. <laughs> and then, and then I, I mean, I can literally remember and, and really almost remember it exactly as... Um, a, a scene from a movie and of where I've seen people in movies saying, you know, that, that they'd slap themselves in the face and say, you got to get a hold of yourself. And, and that's what I did. I mean, because there's 34 you know, seconds 30 still to play. Still for 34 yeah. seconds. I got to get a hold of myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who's the guy in the civilian clothes who's hugging you? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know either. I don't yeah. know who it is. Yeah. Right. <laughs> there, th th these moments you tell us in your book, uh, often are characterized by somebody playing the hero, pretty obviously Paul Henderson, mm -hmm. and somebody ends up being the goat, not greatest of all time goat, right, right. but the person who sort of wears the goat horns. Right. Who is it in this game? I don't know that it's anybody. I mean, I think that, that um, I, I think a little bit for the Soviets, uh, the, the, the name that would be, uh, there was a defenseman named Lyapkin, and he's the one who kind of gave the puck away. But um, I, I think what happened in a way, and, it, and it's one of the really curious things about this series, it is that um, neither of us got what we wanted and all of us and both of us got what we needed. We wanted to win eight straight and by big scores. They wanted to win the series. We needed to win the series. They needed to show that they could play with the absolute best at the top. And, and I think that they, they, you know, that, that they didn't feel that much like losers in a way where then one of their players is going to wear those, those goat horns. And I, and, I think that, and, it, and I think it's why, like 50 years later, it's the favorite memory of almost all of the players on Team Canada, no matter how many Stanley Cups we won. And I think it is for the Soviet players as well, even though they won world championships, many of them, many Olympic gold medals, because I think that they believe that this was their greatest achievement, that they demonstrated that you could play in a different way at the top. And they were right. I mean, that's that changed everything. When's the last time you pulled out your box set of this series and sat down and watched all eight games? You never have, have you? No. You have not watched it. No. Why not? I, I tried to once. I tried uh, the, the summer of 73. Um, one of the networks uh, decided that they, on, on consecutive Sundays, eight Sundays, they would run the series. And I thought, fantastic. I mean, this is great. I mean, gone through it one way, and now I can just sit back, easy chair, you know, and, and, and watch the games. And I lasted three or four minutes. And it was just, I knew what was going to happen. And I knew what I, what I was, you know, uh, um, you know what I was feeling. And, and, and now even worse, I knew what I was about to feel next. And, and that was even worse than, than playing in, <laughs> in, in the game. And so it was, a, no, I, I, I don't need this. Do you ever wonder about what you're, you know, at this point, you're a kid. You are not the six-time Stanley Cup champion yet. You've got one cup at this point. Mm -hmm. Had you thought about what the rest of your career might have been like had you guys lost this series? Mm -hmm. What do you come up with? Yeah, I have at times. And, and um, um, I think it would have been, uh, it, it would have been hard, you know, to, uh, if we had lost the series, um, that the, the atmosphere of Vancouver would have stayed with us. Um, and, and we would have, and, and when we would make bad plays playing for the Toronto Maple Leafs or, Bar or Montreal Canadiens, the fans would have as part of their memory us blowing it in that series and their reaction would be double or triple what it would be of a normal bad play with the Leafs or the, with the Canadiens. And, and, and plus, it would have been humiliating and, and, and just embarrassing. And the kind of thing that when you walk down the street you, and somebody's walking the other way, even though they don't know who you are, 
even though if they know who you are, they may be thinking a thousand things. So far as you're concerned, oh, they have only one thing they're thinking. And they're thinking, he's the guy that blew it. He's the guy that blew it. And those are hard to overcome. You know, those are, and you can pretend otherwise. I mean, you can say, oh, I'm a professional, no big deal, water off my back, just go out and play. I don't, it's, not, it's not that easy. So it would have been hard, but at the same time, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good at, um, at, at deciding no, no point thinking about that. I mean, what, you know, it's an interesting intellectual exercise. But other than that, no, let's get on with it. You know, that, that there's, there's a life to live and, uh, and a season to play. And, and, and what's the point of, of, of that? Let me take you off the ice for a second and just talk very specifically about the process by which you decided what would go in this book. You no doubt had myriad images to choose from. Mm -hmm. The, I love the book so much, not just because you're telling me stuff I didn't know before, and as I indicated off the top, I watched this whole thing. This yeah. was really meaningful. Uh, but it's a beautiful book. Like, yeah. There are beautiful pictures in this yeah. book. How do you know what to put in, what to leave out, yeah. what's meaningful for you, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't like putting pictures in books that I do. And, and, and I, I, it's, I've done it in a few. But you know, originally when I did the game, no pictures. I mean, no pictures right up until... Uh, I think the, the, the game change and, and with the Scotty book. And except in, in paperback versions, they would come out with them. Um, I wasn't sure about pictures in this book. And, and, and the, thing, the, the thing with pictures is, is that either, you know, at least my experience in seeing them in books, is that they either are really kind of afterthoughts and, 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 and feeling as if they are they are required to be there uh, and in a couple of little segments uh, in, in the physical book. But they kind of look like, you know, that they are, again, they, 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 don't, they're like, they look like collages with two or three pictures on a page and, and that neither, no, no picture really matters that much. And so I was like, no, I'm not interested in that. If, if we can do it in a way where each picture really is like uh, it's specially chosen as if it was on the walls of a of a uh, uh, of a museum, and treated with that kind of seriousness. I mean that that one, that one is in in Yaroslavl with 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 Trechak, um, uh, a year after the the the, the Yaroslavl team uh, plane crashed, oh, right. and that was their team locomotive. And it was one of the most moving nights of, uh, of, that I have I've ever had, and of where you had this entire arena, of, you know, and 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 all of them had their their banners up, and they would they were holding them like this, not only you know as in, in loyalty, but it was in defiance. It was like our our plane, our team may have gone down, but we're here, and we're always going to be here. And so that was fun, but you know that 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 photo. But the but the others, it, it's like it, it, the photos have to be deeply personal, deeply evocative, really say something, add to the text. And the, and and one of the things that was the real answer to it, and it's really interesting, hmm. is that this book is a little bit wider. And and what we decided to do is that if we're going to put in photos, and if they're Im, Im, important enough. You can use the full dimension. You can use two pages. Double page. So all of a sudden, if this is a monumental image, it deserves a monumental dimension, mm. and and so you know we could you know we can do that you know mm. with, you know with that, and 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 it was fun. I mean, one of my favorite pictures in here, and I think it tells the story. And I hope I can find it fast enough. And I check. Oh yeah, I can. Is this photo here? It was probably the last Show one. Show which camera. Okay, okay he's got it. There this, we go. is, this is probably the last photo that went in that we discovered. This is Simpson's department store oh, in yeah, Toronto right, right. on a game eight. And so look at look at the people <laughs> there. You know, th this is in the appliance section. There are people s sitting on the floor. You see, you see the people there sitting on the floor. Watching the game. And they're all watching the game. <laughs> yeah. You'd and, never see that today. And never see it. No, and everybody would be on their own phones. That's right. Well, yeah. the, and the, the thing that was just so much fun is the fact that literally this game was played on a Thursday and right across the country. From St. John's, it started at 1.30 in the afternoon. In Vancouver, it started at 9 o'clock in the morning. A work day, a school day, 
midweek, and 22 million Canadians, the population of the time, 16 million watched. Incredible, incredible. Sheldon, can we get the wide shot on the jib here? See that little girl <laughs> in the bottom left-hand corner of the cover? Uh -huh. Can you see, actually, if, if I lean forward, there she is right there. Yeah. Ken, what's the story about her? I had no idea until <laughs> the book came out and that little girl is now whatever age she is, but her name is Ann Peel. And she got in touch with you. She got in touch with me. <laughs> and she weird. was uh, the daughter of somebody who worked in the Canadian embassy at the time. And she now is at, uh, uh, involved with a school in, in, in Toronto, and we will meet up at some point. Fantastic. <laughs> Speaking of meeting up, you had uh, a rather lovely day in your old stomping grounds the other day. For those who don't remember, he used to be a parliamentarian as well. Oh, Can we roll this, please? This is on Parliament Hill in the what is now makeshift House of Commons, not the one you sat in when you were a parliamentarian. But they had a day to honor, there's Anthony Rowe to the speaker, they had a day to honor 50 years later, Team Canada 1972, and in you all walk, and you get a standing ovation, and I have to say, just as you did 50 years ago, you united liberals and conservatives and new democrats and westerners and easterners and central canadians and northerners and people who live close to the border you guys did it again and listen to them chanting canada canada how was that day for you it was terrific i mean it was really um you know that uh, that i mean just the way you described it i mean of, of the, the mps like the floor of the house of commons what it felt like, it felt like sitting on the ice surface in an arena. I mean, it's, and, 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 the, and the banking of the seats is very much like, you know, like an arena. And, and all of these MPs are coming down from their seats to be around the edges to shake hands or, you know, fist pump or, or something like that. And, and the thing that, the thing that is, is nice is that you know, there are other celebrations that are part of uh, this 50th anniversary, but this was Team Canada. This was a Keep Canada, and 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 one of the really appropriate but necessary moments of celebration needed to be in Ottawa. It needed to be on the floor of the House of Commons. And, and it needed to be, because that, it's kind of where the ultimate recognition, uh, a country's recognition comes from. Um, and, 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 and so here it, it was, here it happened, and the MPs were great. The, the, the party leaders, their, their, their speeches were really good. Uh, the prime minister was really good. After this ceremony was over, we're in a room, and the MPs are coming in, and with their stories, and it's, it, 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 we, I think all of us left there feeling as if we mattered a little bit, and that's just kind of nice. <laughs> Way more than a little bit, and, and you probably wouldn't have seen this because you were doing so much handshaking. There was a moment when Pierre Poilievre and Justin Trudeau, who despise each other, let's face mm -hmm. it, caught each other's glance across the floor of the house, and Poilievre looked at him and gave him a nod, and Trudeau looked at Poilievre and gave him a nod. I mean, mm -hmm. you guys are the only thing that yeah. the two of them could agree on, yeah. right? Yeah. It was a moment. Mm -hmm. Let's finish up on this. Um, you and I agree this was the most important hockey series in human history. But I know there are going to be younger people for whom Sidney's Crosby's golden goal at the Olympics or yeah. Gretzky to Lemieux, 1987, Canada Cup, will be of more significance because that's, right. their, that's right. their generation. That's when they were the 12 year That's old. when they were 12. <laughs> can you, uh, I don't know if there's any way to be objective about this, but can you make the, the case that objectively speaking, mm -hmm. without one's 12 year old self and mm -hmm. that bias being brought to bear, mm -hmm. why I'm sorry, this series was yeah. the most important yeah. one ever. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think for, for two very demonstrable reasons that, that as I said earlier about the, the Soviets proving that they could play a different way at the top, it changed hockey. I mean, that, that once that is established, I mean, up until that moment, because Canada had been the, 
originators of hockey, the developers of hockey, the, 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 the country where the best players, like 100% of the players in the NHL were Canadian. Mm. I mean, that's how dominant you know, things were. So the Canadian way was not only the best way, it was the only way. Then fi and finally, here's this country who plays a different way and shows they can succeed playing that way. That opens a mind. You know, that opens the you know, thinking. It's like, God, I, I've always been wondering, why can't we do this? We should try that. You know, and, and it, just, it, it just goes from there. All of the changes that have happened since that time, off ice training, I mean, the, the use of, the, of, of, of gyms, of making yourselves better in the summer, you know, not just in the, in the, in the winter. Um, you know, the, the nutrition, you know, the, the, the place of all of, of all of that, that is totally changed. And then once, once it happens that one country can show that they can do things differently, then it opens up the possibilities for the Swedes, for the Finns, for now players from, from, you know, from all, from Slovenia, you know, making the NHL, from Norway, from Denmark. Germany. Germany, impossible mm -hmm. yeah. that they could play in the NHL. Now they're all playing. Players from, you know, from, from, from Arizona playing in the NHL. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that's what this series did. I mean, it all trails back to this particular moment. So that part of it, and then the other part of it, is as we were talking about just a moment ago, is that you know, a weekday, a school day, a work day, 22 million the population, 16 million watched. Mm -hmm. That wasn't 80, the 87 Canada Cup. That wasn't you know, the Olympics in Vancouver in 2010. I mean, this, this is the, the most, you know, in, 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 in real time shared moment in Canadian history. I mean, all of the other big moments, you know, whether it's Vimy or whether it's the, you know, the, the last spike in Craig Allocky, BC, or whatever the, the other, you know, symbolic huge moments of Canadian history, they weren't shared in a way in which this one was. That's the right answer. <laughs> Uh, the 12-year-old me thanks you and remembers that day extremely well. 50 years ago today, Game 8, that's a terrific book. It's a beautiful work of art. And um, I thank you, as always, for coming into our studio and sharing your wonderful views of this great game. Thanks a lot, Steve. Ken Dryden. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.